and the Ariel Khalifa. Please help me to welcome the Sons of Fenrir. Hopefully this mic is on because I've been yelling sons for the past 24 hours and I'm getting a little hoarse. My name's Rob Elliott and I'm a Viking. Um, what we're going to be talking to you today is first a bit about reenactment in general, Vikings in general, and then into the group. We have 30 minutes of talking, 15 minutes of questions. Uh, very welcome to take the questions, but please hold them till we get to that point in the presentation. We were invited to the expo due to our solid history of basically putting on really good shows. If you have not seen us fight yet, we're out in front of the Coca-Cola stage, uh, which we encourage you to come watch us. We put on at least three shows a day until our arms fall off. The, this panel is advertised as 13th Warrior Fact or Fiction. So I want to talk a bit about drama and movie making versus reenactment. Uh, 13th Warrior, of course, is based on a book by, and I'm probably going to mispronounce it, Michael Crichton, entitled Eaters of the Dead, very loosely based on the story of Beowulf, and uh, a bit of a G-rated version of a Viking funeral of a high-ranking Swedish Viking, and that, and the character in the 13th Warrior was actually a real guy, and if there's any Arab speakers in the room, I apologize, because I'm definitely going to butcher this name, Ahmed Ibn Fadlan. Uh, he was an Arab, possibly Persian diplomat who visited the area around the delta of the Volga River in the 10th century. And his description of a Viking funeral is actually the best document we have on what a real good Viking funeral was like. Um, of course, Michael Crichton, the guy who wrote uh, Eaters of the Dead, 13th Warrior, also wrote Jurassic Park. And ladies and gentlemen, there was more fact in Jurassic Park than there was in 13th Warrior. Um, and that was actually for pretty good reasons when you're trying to make a movie. Movies are about heroic character development. And what we do is about reenacting history. You're paying an actor a million bucks, the last thing you do is put one of these on him so you can't even see his face for half of the movie. Whereas for history, for reenactment, you're not wearing a helmet, you're dead first piece of armor other than a homemade shield that anyone would get would be a helmet. But you rarely see the million dollar actor wearing the right helmet. Um, same thing with shields. Shields was your absolute critical saving you from death item of equipment. But you rarely see your heroic character walking around with a shield all the time. So why do we do Viking reenactment? Well, Vikings had a huge cultural impact over most of the Northern Hemisphere. They went from the Caspian Sea and the foothills of the Ural Mountains all the way to Newfoundland, Lanx Meadows, and I was fascinated to read that they just found a Viking trading post or the remains of a Viking trading post on Baffin Island. Um, reason for that is polar bear skins were really expensive in the Middle Ages. Um, there's records of people gifting polar bears to the Pope uh, to help finance the crusade. So that gives you some idea of the value of a polar bear hide. They had access to some out of northern Norway, but if they could get them from northern Canada, that was even better. Um, they also were all through the Mediterranean. Uh, the Viking longships, absolute top of the line technology of the age, went as far as Constantinople where when the emperor of Byzantium uh, picked the toughest guys in the world that he could find to be his bodyguard, who did he pick? The Vikings, to form his Vangarian guard. Vikings founded cities, Dublin and Ireland, well, not a great history, it actually started as a slave trading center where the Vikings would meet to sell slaves. Also founded countries, Iceland, Greenland, Greenland didn't last when they founded it. The weather was a lot better. 
global warming is not a new thing. There was something called the uh, medieval warming period uh, from when they founded Greenland, weather was a lot better and you could farm there. For how widespread what we do, um, I was at a reenactment of the Battle of Hastings in 2006 where we had 2,000 people on the battlefield and another 1,000 support staff. And the safety instructions for the camp were in 16 different languages. We had people from every country in Europe. It was just, it's pretty awesome to push a bunch of Russians who've driven from Moscow, their van, push it out of the mud in southern England. You know you're dealing with something that has international appeal. Actually, it was a Russian motorcycle gang. It was kind of cool. So who were the Vikings? Viking is both a verb, as in to go a vikening, and a noun to describe the group or society. And the noun really came into use later. Before, when people were talking about Vikings, they were basically talking to someone about Scandinavian area, what we now call Denmark, Norway, or Sweden, who would get on a boat, go somewhere to steal something. And stealing something is really wrong to describe it that way. What was more important was the raid. They had to have the battle before they stole it. Um, and it's interesting, this is actually a big thing within society. A lot of what we know about the Vikings came out of the Icelandic sagas. Again, Iceland, country entirely settled by Vikings, most of which were political refugees. Anybody that got beaten up by a king in Norway, Sweden, or Denmark and had to go someplace would go out to Iceland, or sometimes, and if they really, really, uh, didn't get along with their neighbors to the point where they earned a name like Eric the Red. He gets the red from being a murderer. He had to come all the way to Greenland and eventually to Canada. In Engel's saga, they actually talk about him uh, raiding a farm on the coast. And when we say a farm, it would actually be a, you know, an industrial operation, probably 20 or 30 people running one of these big farms. And he and his crew got captured. But uh, Engel escaped in the middle of the night and released his men, stole whatever he could from the farm and snuck off in the night. And then the saga, and I'll quote it briefly, this journey is terrible and hardly suitable for a warrior. We have stolen the farmer's money without his knowledge. We should have never allowed such a shame to befall us. So what do they do? They don't just go to their boat and get on it and sail away. They go back to the farm, light the main farm building on fire, and either burn everyone in it alive or kill them as they're trying to get out the door. And that was considered a good thing for the Vikings because then they had a fight before they stole something. So you always need the fight. One thing too about Viking society that is not generally known is when we talk about treasure and what they'd be out trying to loot was slaves. Uh, there was actually a slave round. You would start in southern Norway or Denmark sail over to Ireland in the spring, raid Ireland, capture a bunch of young women, men and women, boys, load them on your longboat, sail down to either southern Spain, which was at that time occupied by the Muslims, normally called Andalus, or Morocco, sell them to the Arabs in the north of Africa, buy silk, buy dates, buy olives, buy fancy jewelry, sail back to Norway, give it all to the girls to impress them. That's what Vikings did. Okay. They were also explorers and traders. Um, very sophisticated technology. The longboats I've already referred to. Viking era, roughly defined in English-speaking countries between 793, when there was the first raid on a monastery called Lindisfarne, and up to 1066, when they had the last big Viking raid into England which was uh, defeated in a battle of, near the city of York called Stanford Bridge by Harold the Dreda. He's the guy who eventually caught an arrow in his eye at the Battle of Hastings and was replaced by the Normans. And remember that the Normans, Normans are basically Christianized Vikings. They were given a part of France in 9-11 uh, by King Charles III to buy him off. They settled there and uh, now, now the part of France known as Normandy, entirely settled, dominated by Vikings. So very quickly, 
Reenactors, and what's cool about Viking reenactment? Price point is fairly low to entry, hundreds of dollars rather than thousands of dollars. You don't have to buy full plate armor. Um, and our style of combat, the shield wall, is very much a group activity. You're utterly dependent on your friends, and if you fail them or they fail you, you die. So it's a very good way of building group cohesion. <laughs> so George is going to take over, and we were going to do introductions. George is going to tell you all about what we do and who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as he said, my name is George. My, my Viking name is Halder. Uh, Vital. Uh, we have several other members that will introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to touch quickly on uh, some of the aspects of the actual reenactment and what we do. Uh, we are the sons of Fenrir. Uh, sons! <laughs> we are a local group here in Calgary. We have uh, 30, 30 plus members, uh, but we're not we're not just this small little niche and the only thing, the only game in town. There's other groups within, within Alberta, within Canada, North America. We're all part of something called Vikings Vinland. Uh, many groups, Toronto, Winnipeg, Brandon, all through Alberta, uh, down into New Mexico, Indiana, all over the place. <clears throat> we also fall under Vikes UK, which is for lack of a better phrase, the, the mother organization. It was started in the mid-70s in the uh, United Kingdom. Viking and Norse Reenactment Society, they have thousands and thousands and thousands of members worldwide, mainly through, through Europe, but they have groups as far as uh, they, Australia, here in Canada, they have group in, they actually have a group in South America. So it's not just a small community. We are a small community in a much larger community of reenactors. We are very, very passionate about what we do. Uh, yes, we do have our fight shows and we show the combat, but that's not what we're all about completely. We, when we set up a full village display, it's like stepping back in time a thousand years. We do a lot of research on what we do to be as authentic as we can to show the true Viking lifestyle, the true life of people in that time frame. My personal favorite phrase, we become walking, talking, living, breathing textbooks. You can read in a textbook, this is what happened. And you might go, well, how did that work? Come to the village, see us living, and you understand how life worked. Rage in all ages, we've had, uh, anywhere from six months old to 70 year olds in the villages. It's just fantastic. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, we do a lot, a lot of research to make sure that we're authentic in what we do. The fighting that we do, uh, that's, the, that's the fun part. That's what a lot of people come to see. I like the education factor where we can educate people. Uh, when it comes to fighting though, it is, we use steel weapons, just like this. It's actual steel weapon. Uh, we train extensively. Our group trains on average uh, four to six hours a week from the time that the sun or from the snow melts till it comes back. And at times we've been known to shovel the snow off the field so we can still fight even in, even in the snow. Uh, we treat it very much like a martial art in the training that we do. We want it to be safe. We want to make sure that things look good. We, we want to have it look like we kill our friends, but we don't because we want to do it all again tomorrow <laughs> and again later today and next week and next month and for years and years to come. <clears throat> sure. Uh, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, he's going to talk more about the weapons and uh, more of the combat. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. You know, this is my first Comic Con, so I'm like totally, or, or Comic Expo, I'm totally blown away by what I'm seeing. So I'm out of my element. This, this stuff is great. You people are awesome. I can't believe you support these kinds of things. It's great to see. I'm glad you came out to see us too. My name is Kelly Titus. Um, my Viking name is Floki Scalismiter. Um, this year I am the 
Jarl of the Sons of Fenrir, so I'm the group leader. I'm also part of the large organization Vinland Vikings. I am the combat thane or officer for the entire society. So over 300 people, they're my responsibility to make sure that they train properly, that they follow all the safety regulations, that if there's any disputes on the field that they get settled properly. We're going to talk about the weapons. Everyone likes weapons. I know I like weapons. So like you said, they're all real weapons. Um, all the way from the spear or the, the, the little a the sacks all the way up to a Dane axe. So I'll quickly rip through them just to give you an idea of what you're going to see out there. So a sax. Every free man got to carry one of these. It's your knife. You use it for everything. You use it to eat. You use it to skin animals. You use it to whittle wood. And you use it to kill people on the field of battle. Um, some poor men would only show up to battle with this. So you can imagine in a wall of three or 400 people mashed in there, and the only thing you have is this tiny little knife. And that's what you're going to go to war with. It's pretty scary stuff. So that's how you could denote, you could find a free man in society. If they carried a sax of any length, they were free. Um, the other thing you saw a lot of, very common, was a hand axe. Almost every free man owned a hand axe simply because you cut down wood with it. You, it, it was a utility piece of equipment. It wasn't just designed for war. Now Vikings had a very uh, distinct shape to their axes. Um, they have little wings on the top and bottom. It was stylized, but it also had a purpose. We dull ours, but these would be usually sharp. They would come up to a point and then down to the blade. They would be used to hook limbs, uh, elbows, around the back of the neck. They would reach underneath and hook you in the back of the leg and pull you through. They would also be used to hook shields in the shield wall. So when you're formed up in this tight formation, they would take the ax, throw it over the top of the shield, and try and pull the shield open or pull the guy out of the wall so he could be easily killed by you know, your fellow shield wall mates. Um, stepping up from there, we see spears. We've got lots of spears, one-handed spears and two-handed spears. Again, they have kind of neat designs. The one on the left there has wings on it. And the same purpose of the wings, they would use them to catch shields and try and pull them out of the way. The spearmen were very plentiful. They were very cheap to make, so if you're outfitting an army, that'd be your number one staple. Very little metal, lots of wood, you could, easy to pump out, send out hundreds of guys with spears. Um, unfortunately though, when you're fighting sharp weapons, spear shafts get broken. They were sort of a disposable piece of equipment. Uh, for the record, they weren't thrown. Um, they didn't hurl away their weapons. They made throwing weapons, like a javelin, which we don't have here. Your spears were made to fight with, not to hurl. That's a movie thing, guys throwing spears across the battlefield and skewering two or three guys and sticking them to a tree. It actually doesn't happen, surprisingly enough. Um, we had a big old terror weapon, real scary stuff. We had what's called a Dane axe. So up to a six feet in length, the haft, and a large head. They would be used in the back rank and dropped on people's heads. Um, they would split helmets, they would split heads, they would cleave off arms. They were a formidable and very scary weapon, although they were also very uh, cumbersome and clumsy. So fighting one-on-one -on -one with a Dane axe probably wouldn't happen. Um, they were used for other things. Um, now the sort of the most iconic weapon that everyone thinks that all Vikings owned was the sword. Now swords were extremely rare as opposed to the movies where you have whole armies armed with swords. That would be very untrue. Swords were very, very rare because they were so expensive to manufacture. There was so much metal and so much craftsmanship that went into creating one sword that um, they'd be the cost of a house today. Um, now, a true sword is not hard. All these weapons are hard, they have no flex. A real sword has a lot of flex in it because of the manufacturer, if they don't flex, they will break when you hit something. So, different types of metals, all put together in one sword, hardened metals on the edges to keep a edge, and softer metals, mild metals in the middle to give you the flex so they didn't break. Um, that's it? Yeah, I can talk quickly about the combat, real quick. Shield wall combat was how Vikings fought. That's how everyone fought in this era. They didn't show up on the battlefield and then run all willy-nilly at the enemy, which you see in every movie. Um, they would form up, they would interlock all of their shields in a giant wall, sometimes two, three, or four ranks deep, depending on how many men you had and your opposing army would do the same, and that is how you would fight. You would come up to the middle, and you would 
front ranks would meet and they would mash each other and they would be up close. So the long weapons were of no use in the front rank. You were face to face with your guys, spitting on them, breathing on them, and stabbing underneath the shield or trying to get them in the face. And the guys would get crushed and trampled and it, it was brutal. And then they would back up and then they would do it again. And then they would back up and then they would make formations that would try and break through the wall. So a boar snow, which is like a, like a wedge. And they would run at the opposing wall and try and break a hole through it so they could get in behind them and slaughter them. It was slow, monotonous, and hard combat. If you were to run at a shield wall by yourself, trying to be a hero, you would be killed instantly. Spears would drop, axes would fall, and you wouldn't even make it through the front rank. Um, so it was a gritty type of combat. So when you watch movies, you see them all form up really nice, and it looks like it's gonna be real, and then they start running, which it just wouldn't happen. Why fight as a sole man when you can fight as an army of 300? Making no reference to the movie 300. <laughs> as an army of 450. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess, are we open for questions, I guess? So if anybody has any questions, um, do you want to, guys want to introduce yourself on the end so they know who to ask? That'd be awesome. Stand up, yell. Hi, my name's Katie, and I'm a new student. Uh, really quickly, so I just wanted to say, I think it's really cool that you guys are here Um, not a myth, not a myth. Uh, they certainly were berserkers. Um, it, oh, sorry, the question was Viking berserkers, fact or myth? They were certainly not a myth, they were a fact. Uh, there's actually though a strong religious component to berserkers. It was almost like a, a secret society of these bears arcs, bearmen. Um, and guys who would take the spirit of the bear into themselves. And a lot of what's written down, of course, that we know about the Viking era is written down by Christian priests later. So they left out, obviously, a bunch of the good stuff. Um, we have descriptions of battles where they talk about, you know, it's almost they're magical, where arrows are flying at them but not hitting them. You know, good, good saga type stuff. Really what they were is a shock weapon. There is uh, some dispute as to whether they would be drugged up or not. The jury is sort of out on that, and there's a lot of guys with PhDs that have opinions on that, so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Um, alcohol may have been a, a factor. Alcohol was often actually a factor in a, in a lot of battles. Um, not a lot's changed between Dark Ages and now. Um, but they would be sent in typically early to try to disrupt the wall. Um, Kelly was telling us how critical maintaining the wall is. And you get some guy who is absolutely no fear of death and is so drugged up he has no pain, feels no pain, and he's coming at you with the bejesus big axe in each hand, you just might flinch. And then the main shield wall is following up right behind this berserker to take advantage of the disruption that he causes in the wall. Hopefully that answered. Go ahead, sir. Okay, um, since part of the title of this was the Christian Warrior. Yeah. The whole, um, okay, the thing about them, like, basically blowing snot into a bowl and then it passing it around, where did that come from? We don't do it. We don't do it. I know. I, my, my name in another life is Valgard Forkbeard. Okay, uh, as close as we come to that is passing the mead bottle well, from yeah, hand to hand. Which is reasonable, but where did that? I honestly do not have, anybody know? It's called Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Some writer with a great imagination. Yeah. Not a great imagination. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, once it's in one Hollywood movie, because it was in 13th Warrior, 
Then they made the current miniseries Vikings, and it's in that one too. So now it's like an, it's an expected thing. Um, I've read a lot of stuff on Vikings, a lot of sagas. I've never encountered it. The question was uh, the miniseries, The Vikings, how authentic or how good it is. I'm going to pass this one to Kelly. Oh, no, unless you want to take this one. You want me to take this one? Okay. <laughs> Did you want to take this one? No, no, no. I, mean, I don't even watch it. Oh, my God. You know, I haven't watched all the episodes, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, I started watching it, and then I kind of lost interest, and then I kind of started watching it again. There are parts of it that are what I would feel is historically correct and fabulous. There are other parts of it that I think are uh, horrendous. Um, and some parts are just are inconsistent. Clothing and armor are kind of inconsistent. Lots of leather, and uh, whereas linens and wools were very predominant, leathers just were not. They provided no warmth in the winter, whereas wools would. Um, armor that they had, I, last night I watched an episode and they had like plates on them, but I mean they weren't wearing plates. I mean it was it was Bernie's, it was ring mail. Um, the ships are great. They did a great job on the ships. They look fantastic. Um, the way they raid is fantastic, but again the way they fight. Um, you know I saw one episode where they made a shield wall on the beach, which was great, and the Vikings stayed in a shield wall, and then the opposing army just formed up a shield wall and then ran at them. Like I said, they do in all the shows, and of course they all got killed. Um, no one would do that. I mean, they just, they, that's just not the style of fighting. Um, it's just like today in modern military, we wouldn't form up a gun line and walk out in the middle of the battlefield like they did in 1812. It just wouldn't happen because they would get slaughtered. It's the same thing. That's why they didn't do it then. It just wasn't the style of combat. So there are parts that are good. There's some that aren't, but you know what? I'll leave it up to all of you to make judgment on the show because we're not here to try and wreck anything for anybody. If you enjoy it, that is awesome. Um, so, so if a sword costs about as much as a house, how much would a ship cost just because of the anchor? Oh, wow. Uh, ships, yeah, you know, uh, that's why if you owned a ship, you were a Jarl. Um, you would provide for people. You had a vast amount of money. You didn't just start off as a Viking like, hey, I think I'm going to go Viking today. I'm going to go pick up my ship from the shipyard and off I go. These guys already had uh, a lot of wealth. And... Ships like swords were passed down. You know, the shipmaster, the Jarl, the guy who owned the boat gets killed in the battle. Someone else takes the ship over and keeps going. It's, um, it's very few ships were commissioned by just your average guy. They were commissioned by kings. Um, they would have armies, and then they would give ships to people, trusted advisors who would let them go raiding to make them money. It was an investment by the Jarl. He would give you a ship, but he, there was a return to him for the use of his ship. Oh, we actually have uh, an individual in our society who has a ship. Uh, he owns a Viking boat. It's a, uh, what is it, a nine-man? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a nine-man fairing, so, but it has the proper wood square sail, or wood, wood, woolen square sail, uh, oars. It's all handcrafted and properly. It floats. We sail it in Lake Winnipeg. It's, uh, it's a fantastic little piece of equipment. So they're fantastic boats. Yes, up there. Hi there. Um, it sounds like... Uh, Y'all would have killed each other a whole lot. Uh, was there a big sex imbalance in the society? Were there a lot more women than there were men? <laughs> yes, I get answers on it. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, a lot of what we know is based off of grave finds. And unfortunately, when they started excavating graves, they looked at it and they said, hey, that's a sword, that's a guy. Hey, that's a brooch, that's a girl. Um, what they're looking at now and what most more recent evidence shows is that um, raiding parties may or may not have been 50-50. Um, many sagas show women captaining ships um, as well as fighting over single men. Um, it was very different than what we tend to imagine. Hey, hey. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, um, women had more power than you would have thought. Uh, not all of the power once Christianity came in. Of course, that changed. But at the time, a lot of uh, parties were 50-50. There were women raiding in Greenland, as well as settling Iceland. Cool. That kind of goes with my question, because I was going to ask whether or not the shield maidens 
were true and whether or not they had a part in combat with the shield wall? Um, that is something that is still up for contention. Um, we have evidence of the saga saying men were sent to women to train to fight. We know uh, to a small extent women were able to defend their homestead. In terms of the Valkyrie and shield maiden idea, hard to say. You wouldn't go out and fight in a dress. I mean, it's, it would be very difficult. <laughs> but I can't really answer that one. Do, you want to Do I want to take yeah. a shot at it? Uh, yeah, you know what, I, I can only infer because like you said, there's no historical evidence one way or the other whether women fought in a shield wall or not. Um, I know that women were sent to train, that was part of them being young. Men would go and learn women's duties when they were young boys, and women would go and learn men's duties. They would learn how to fight, they would learn how to use a shield, usually from their uncle, um, and the boys would also go and learn how to be in the kitchen. They would learn how to sew, they would learn how to cook. I mean, when they went out raiding, they didn't take their wives with them all the time and to cook and sew and clean for them. They had to do it all themselves. So there was cross. Now, whether women were in the shield wall, I would venture to say no, personally. Um, you are, when you are undersized and underweighted, um, it's very easy to get pushed around and crushed. Now, they may have taken part and maybe in the back ranks where they were maybe on a spear, something where um, the physical strength of being right in the front wasn't as important they may have taken part in the back ranks if it was needed. That's a guess. Hi, over here. Um, was there a religious aspect at all to the Viking raids? Did they feel like they were conquering more land for Odin or was it purely for monetary gain? Um, the raids, there, there's a lot of speculation as to why the Vikings started raiding. Um, some people think it was because there was no more land and that there was too many people. So they were looking to expand. Um, the first thing that kicked off the Viking Age was the raid on Lindisfarne. Um, that also is under contention. Some people think it was revenge. Some people think it was opportunity. Um, in terms of raiding for glory for Odin, not hugely. I mean, you, you died in battle. That was the best thing I think we can agree for a Viking was to die in battle so you would have that glory. You can die, but your reputation will live forever. Um, not hugely a religious thing. No crusades, really, for the Vikings. They, they were there for the money. So just kind of a society question, if anyone in the room wanted to, you know, start joining in or start, uh, you know, how would you start them off? What would you recommend that they do? Uh, basically what you do is you come out uh, and see us and see how, you know, how you connect with the, the group. Uh, you come out for three practices before you even touch a weapon. All right, uh, and then after three practices, you, you know, you see if you're still interested, and then we start showing you the basic eight moves on uh, hand weapons, and then we slowly progress from there. Okay. All right, it's about the best I can do, you know. <laughs> like, I'm a chef by trade as well, so can I help out with other people? Oh yeah, yeah, you, you're my, he's my cook. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, the recipes we we use are root chap, <laughs> which we not very good. The recipes we use are really basic recipes. Uh, I mean, I make a ham soup, and it's just ham, uh, mushrooms, uh, onions, leeks, stuff like that. So they're really easy recipes. We, we, we've done a show, we cooked 17 racks of ribs on an open fire. It was just like, hey, barbecue, yay! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, honestly, you can help out. I mean, we've got books on the, the recipes that the Vikings used. Yeah, and it's, like I say, and they're healthy, really healthy. Okay. Right. Anybody, anybody? Oh. Yep. Um, you went over how the weapons were used. Can you tell us a little bit about the design of the shields? Why yeah. they're round, what this thing in the middle is? Okay, shields. You know what, um, our shields are not 100% historically correct. We use plywood because it's available to us, it's easy for us to use. What they would have done was uh, created a plank shield. So they would have cut thin planks of wood, overlap them one direction, and then overlap them another direction. Tack them together to create a solid flat face. Then on the fronts of the shields, they would usually use linen and face the front of the shield with linen and then edge it with a leather. Now you see a lot of movies and they have metal on their shields or their shields are metal. It just wasn't done, it was too expensive. Shields were disposable. Shields, one shield might not even last you a battle. When they went Viking, they would carry a number of shields with them. And when they went raiding, they would carry their life on their shields. So they might have three or four shields on them. When a battle started, they'd throw them down, pick up one, 
and start fighting. When that thing got hacked to bits, they would fall out from the front rank, another guy would step in, he would go back and gather another shield. And they would just keep recycling shields. The only part on it that's usually metal is the center bit, which is called the boss. That's just to protect your hand. That's the most important part. You don't want to lose your hand. The rest of it is just to stop blows. So they were disposable, just wood and leather, uh, very little metal on them. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the cost of metal um, and a sword being like a house. So what about the chain mail and the helmets? Uh, same sort of thing. Uh, mail and helmets were, were very expensive. Quite often they were gifted to you. You wouldn't have them commissioned. You would work for someone who had a ship. So we'll call him a Jarl. And you would go raiding. And uh, you would be gifted stuff. So if you were excellent battle, you saved his life, you, you did something momentous and, and uh, saga worthy, you would quite often get a ring, an arm ring. So it would be a solid ring of, uh, of silver that you wear on your arm. Um, when you killed enemies, you would strip them of their gear. And then the Jarl would decide who was gifted the gear. So you pull helmets off and he would give those helmets out. If there was a, a suit of mail, that would be gifted to someone. So you mentioned the swords are quite rare. Um, uh, would, um, how, like how many in an army, what would a standard army size be? How many would have swords and how many would have chain mail? Ooh, that's tough. Um, it was a very low number of guys that would have mail. We're talking raiding Vikings or we're talking an army. An army and Vikings are kind of two separate things. Vikings could be 50 guys on a ship. Uh, an army could be, you know, 100 ships. So it could be, you know, 500, 5,000 guys. It just depends on what they were after. Um, yeah, most of the army would be the feared, and they would just have cloth on and no helmets. The top warriors would have mail and helmets, and they would stand out, and you knew who the guys, the real fighters were, the guys in the mail and the guys in the helmets. Everybody else would just sort of be there to fight, hopefully to make money supporting their Jarl. Yeah, just going back to the shields uh, and going back to the 13th Warrior, there was a scene there, the one-on-one uh, -on -one fight scene where they seemed to have to go through three shields each. I was wondering, was the, uh, that based on history? Was there any written record of uh, fights like that? Uh, yeah, that is in reference to something called uh, uh, Hong Kong. Um, you would settle disputes sometimes uh, with individual combat to the death, uh, and they would set shields aside. You would have a choice of weapon, uh, and you would fight within a certain square. They would lay out a, a, a certain a square that you that you could you know, fight in. You would have three shields. If they got destroyed, done, you were done, and if you were still wanting to fight, you would be fighting without a shield. And I think that pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see us, of course, our village is just outside the building in front of the Coca-Cola stage and we're right along the building. We have a village out there. Please come on out and check us out. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sons of Fenrir.